did that, but I'm sure, but now we refer to it to to inform our humanness. Uh, if you, you know, they, they said we can put Ubuntu at the center of how we see each other and the policies we build. Um, and so these simple words and culture and identity, I think, are so important, first and foremost. And um, and the idea that if we own, if we are a proud African, and proud African does not mean that you just you are, you know who you are. You are comfortable in your blackness. Your um, the sense of self, knowing the sense of self, and I'm going back to that word, agachia, which means the dignity of the African. So the dignity of African is embracing who you are, and knowing that the history we've had of subjugation and domination and all that, I think we must always bring back into understanding what that has done to us, and also knowing that we must take the power back. And so the power is taken back by actually embracing the same reasons why we were rejected and dominated and uh, and these stereotypes that President Kagame talks about, the negative stereotypes that have been shaped around us, black people are this, Africans are lazy, these sort of things. And these are some of the things that stereotypes are very dangerous because they become, when they become mainstream and they are not challenged, they become a way of perception, they, they inform perception of things, of people, so I think the starting point is to just be comfortable in our Africanness and just sit with that. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, just sit with that. And the next thing is, because if, if you're comfortable with that, then the geopolitical situation that um, Donald is talking about is real. The problems of the Congo, for example, in DRC. How is it possible that we still have these challenges in the DRC? in this day and age, with that kind of leadership. I mean, Europe had to get a consensus of how not to go to war between Germany and France because they understood their <laughs> inherently that their common future depended on them being uh, having a Europe which was at peace. So at what point, at how many, at what cost of human life are we going to first reach for the DRC or for the leaders within the Great Lakes region to understand that we need peace in the DRC, not even just for DRC for itself, but even us as a people, as Africans, is because you have to ask yourself, human life, when 10 people die in the United States because of a shooting, because of a landslide, in Europe, when something happens and 10, it's headline news, when thousands of people die in the Congo, it's just a footnote. So is African life, and even within our society, so is African life less valuable than the life of, let's say, a European? At what point will we also ask ourselves, because we some, sometimes we cause these things. We can't still go back to say we were colonized, we were dominated, and whatever. So we need to start valuing who we are, and who we are is just sometimes hate. You know, when people internalize hate, you even hate the sign. When you see, I was watching some of the videos in Eastern DRC, and you're looking at a, 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 a one of the, so the one black man on the other, an African to another. Literally, I mean, the brutality. Like some of the soldiers in DRC are just killing and brutalizing their own citizens, and it's all caught on video, and it's not horrifying us. We're not horrified by it. Because if we are horrified by it, then we'll be calling that. Because at what point do we stop understand? Because the the rest, I don't want to say the white man, because the white man dominated us. But the rest of the world will also treat us the way we are treating ourselves. You know. So if we don't value human life, if we don't value each other in terms of culture and identity, if we don't value in terms of um, the, the the intellectual space that uh, Donald referred to. If we cannot have the freedom of thought and of expression, so how can we be then be creative? And how can we be courageous to sort of follow through and build the sort of organizations like the Leo Africa Institute? And the, I mean, the, when I say courage, I think the, that, that word courage. Yeah, and the courage, because it requires courage, because it comes with enormous sacrifice. Um, some which we, we don't have to talk about now, but the, the, the sacrifices that come or the risks that you take. And I'll quickly say something, William. How do you take it back? We must take this power back. And that's the starting point. At an individual level, who we see ourselves. 
I was mentioning to Kwezi a conversation I had with someone. So I commonly get these comments of someone saying, oh, you know, Leo, you're, play, you're pushing this agenda, or you're pushing this agenda, you're, pu you're building a very liberal, pro-Western thinking. And I'm like, what are you even talking about? You know what I mean? First of all, what are you doing? Let's first of all, what are you doing? You know? And number two, and one of the people I was having this conversation with was a very senior person in one of the governments, and, and I was asking him, have you really cared that the State Department of the United States has a program that actually takes hundreds of young Africans, takes them to the United States every year, takes them through a training that lasts months, places them in Africa in American institutions, trains them, bring, they come back, they build a network around it. Now they've even built a much more robust network through the regional programs where they're doing much more trainings online. So they are building a network all across Africa of any of the young person who is pushing a positive agenda in Africa. So the United States government literally has a database of anyone who is anyone on the African continent. Of people like of you. people like you. <laughs> but guess what? There's no questioning from the African government. There's no public political leader who has come out to say, can we understand this program? Can we make a contribution to it? I think it's fine having these programs, but can we make input into this program? What value systems are you setting for these young people? What is the, out, the or outcome that you, because if you're training people to shape a certain society, to what direction is that? So I was asking this gentleman, I said, where is the outrage about, and you hear accusing me of, I'm trying to do something with the most minimal resources, and we're only what? You guys are what, like 100 people? These are whole thousands of people who are being trained. So this is also the other question. To answer your question is, yeah. even our own systems need, they've not yet fully understood what is at stake. In Africa, we, Africa in the world, and yesterday we had a conversation about that. Africa in the world, and how we must prepare our young people to understand their place in this ever-changing world, driven by technology, and what must be done. So you, you get labeled for this and for that. And, yeah. oh, well, I mean, that's just extremely powerful. I, and I picked up quite a bit, I'm sure the audience have, and I like that we're really serving us clean, uh, neat, close-knit community. Um, the word courage. So every time you see problems in Central Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, I do quite a bit of work across Africa. The word that always crops up in my 